Whether five months old or five years old, connection is the basis for a pleasant and comfortable walk with our dogs. Loss of that connection will also be at the root of an unpleasant experience. A dog can get into a zone despite the discomfort of a collar against the neck or harness chafing in their pits. There's lots of people out there willing to say all kinds of dog walking equipment, and one size does not fit all. There is a way to find comfort and pleasure for both parties, but as with all things of value, it's not a quick fix. And get this, clicker training may not be the best tool to teach your dog to walk with you as you go through the world together. On this episode of Learning About Dogs, we talk about connected walking. Kay Lawrence and Sue McGuire, thanks for listening, and here you go. I remember 20 years ago, you know, when we first started to get online and talk about clicker training, there was a whole movement to click for a loose leash. Sometimes I'll say lead because we use leads rather than leashes, but it gets confusing between leading the dog and having a lead. So we'll stick to a leash. Um, and I thought, well, how can you click for the leash being loose? Because the dog could actually be doing 17 different things that would end up, the outcome would be the leash being loose. I mean, he could be scraping chewing gum off the pavement. Yes. Or he could be just standing still while he watches a tractor go past. Or, you know, there's 101 things that a dog could do that ends up in a loose leash. And if you click for all these things, how would the dog actually work out what they're supposed to do? <laughs> you know, walk along chewing gum off the pavement or looking at you or, you know, there's, there's once there starts to become like too many things to work out what you're getting clicked for, you just stop trying to work it out. Um, and if you if you don't believe that, let me give you a training session where I click for absolutely everything. But just one thing happens to be the one I'm looking for. You, people just start to shut down very quickly. So the the lead not being tight is an outcome from very specific behavior or skill cluster that we have to look at. And I look at the dogs coming into the barn for training and they're, they're chugging in ahead of the um, owner and they look at me and they say, could you stop this person pulling? <laughs> So is that if the, if there's a tight connection between the two of us, why is it always the dog that's pulling? Why is it not the person that's not, not walking fast enough? So then somebody says, but but the dog's pulling me. I said, well, if you were walking at the dog's speed, would there be a tight leash? Uh, let's try it out then. So what I normally do is get a piece of paracord and I'll tie it to the clothing of the person, normally something like a belt carrier, we tie it on the dog's collar. So there's no feeling of being on a lead. And I said, now just go at the dog's trot. So we look at the dog trotting down the lane and the dog, jog the person will probably have to jog along behind a bit. And goodness me, there's no tight lead. I said, so who was pulling? So, I mean, there's a whole raft of things here. I, there is definitely a disparity in height and stride length. So generally, if the dog's shoulder height is below your knee level, they will trot as you go for a good walk, i.e. you're walking with purpose from A to B, and that will probably be the dog's trot. And I doubt if you'd see any lead walking because you're both moving at a comfortable pace that's comfortable to both of you. So why would they pull? So the only result then in the dog racing to the end of the lead is, is chasing something or going after something. They're breaking out a trot. So if they maintain trot and you maintain that speed, the, the lead is loose. Um, now, if you're talking about dogs with a shoulder height above your knee, but below your hip, their trot, their length of stride on the trot will be faster than your length of stride when you're walking. That's just a physical fact. So it's a little bit like me walking a six year old child. Either I have to slow down or the child will have to do a sort of this half shamble walk to keep up with me. Um, and if you've ever had a partner that's a foot taller than you or a foot shorter than you, you'll know that you adjust your stride to be able to stay level with them and have a conversation. But sometimes you see this. <laughs> that's one of my airport watching things where you see the guy, you know, and some of these, when you get off an aircraft, there is a long walk down to wherever you're going to go next. Seriously, and people are heading off with some urgency. Well, the guys are going streaming ahead of the ladies. Yes, I wonder why. Probably because they're taller. OK, so if a guy has to walk at the same rate as his partner, who's a foot shorter, 
either they will take a few steps and stop or they'll learn to take a shorter stride or a slower stride. But be well, yes, but sometimes you see them just walking six foot ahead, not knowing that the wife is struggling to keep up. Uh, you know, and everyone's nodding their head going, yeah, yeah, I've had one of those. Either if you're a fast walker, you think, why are they so slow? <clears throat> or if you're just struggling to keep up, you're going, can't you just slow down? So either the dog can, the dog can't trot slower. The amount of flexibility in a trot gait is very, very limited. They can extend slightly. They can reach slightly. But if they do slower, they look like one of these racehorses jigging on the spot, you know, and it looks a bit darn weird. So now we have to find out what speed can we be compatible at that doesn't compromise either of us. And we both have to go much slower. So the dog comes down to a walk or an amble. And so does the person. It should be the speed of shopping. Shopping in an area where there's interest to the left and the right and plenty of people around that you have to be able to move around as you're going along. This is not the rush hour, getting off the train, heading into work type of speed where everyone's heading in the same direction and you just get carried along. You can't afford to amble in that environment, but certainly... So, so then we start to look at... Now we're at a compatible speed... We then need to look at different types of reasons to go in for a walk. So what's the function? If you're going out, the dog goes out for a walk to what? To get to the park or to see what smells are good over there or to see what that dog's just eaten or to sniff the air as they're going past a, an opening in a fence. You know, there's a whole host of reasons the dog goes for a walk, mostly to enjoy now, i.e. what's coming in their noses now. Can I go and have a look and pee, sniff that marking over there, and then I'll leave my mark, and then I'll have a look at that grass over there, and I'll see where the pigeons have gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the person says, I'm going for a walk, and they do not like to break their walk. They want to walk and not stop walking and keep going walking, 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 walking. Well, for the dog, this is alien in the first place. They would only do that if they were exhausted and needed to make their way somewhere with no leisure time whatsoever for sort of browsing the walk. So from the dog's point of view, the walk is about going for a sniff. It's the same as us doing shopping in um, an area that's designed to catch your interest. You know, those what I call tourist shop areas, some, you know, where you go, oh, I've never seen one of those or an area that you've never been shopping before. I mean, if I go to a different country and you put me in a supermarket, it takes me hours to go around because if you want just something like a plain packet of biscuits, you've got to read every packet because you don't recognize the packaging. So if somebody from New Zealand comes over here, certain amounts of stuff is going to look similar, but they're going to have to really go slow and read everything. Well, to me, that's a dog going for a walk. If they're in a new area, they'll want to stop and examine and check out and make sure they feel safe and then progress a bit more and wonder what's happening over there. And if something major occurs that they're not sure about, the natural response is to stand still particularly with youngsters, particularly with puppies, the first time they see a guy go by on a bicycle, they're going to stand still, watch it go past, and then set off again. Because at that age, they can't process lots of new information as well as move. And if you're unsure about something, you would stand still. And it's this is often a default response to not knowing what to do or where to go. Um, the classic one is when often when people walk into um, an airport, got all their baggage, say goodbye to everybody, and they go into the building and come to a stop because they don't know where to go, which means that somebody else crashed in the back of them. But <laughs> finding out what to do or where to go would often bring you to a standstill because you don't know where to go. Um, if you've ever been on the London Underground and you're not familiar with it, same effect. Everybody else knows where to go except you. So um, <laughs> slowing down to stop to make decisions about where to go, something could have triggered that response off on the dog if they need to stand still then the person should stand still with them so a walk would have many different functions it could be for a browse to see new experiences to have a look around um, it could be pure emergency let's travel right now because we have to cross the road and that is not the same as browsing we don't browse across the road and i don't want an emergency walk down the street I might have to move the dog from the car to the house or from the car to the veterinary surgery. Short distance, no time for browse. This is a 
hey, sorry, we need to travel. And we need to have an understanding that each of these types of being together come with a complete set of different cues, a completely different purpose, and probably a different reinforcer. So let's have a look at going for a browse. So if you're going for a browse, <laughs> I, I took a friend of mine from California um, to a very famous garden up um, just up the top of the hill from us here. And it has rooms. So you go through the white room or the rose room. And they're not actually rooms. They're just areas segmented off with hedges. So as you go through, but everything's labeled like a good garden with lots of, um, you know, the plants have all got proper labels underneath them. And you've got a booklet and you can see which plant is which, or you could write down plants that you might want to have. But the idea is that you go, you stop, you sniff, you look at them. And there's probably, I don't know, 50 or 60 different plants in each room. And then you go on to the next one, which might be a pond area or it might be a hedge area, whatever it is. So as you're going through, so my friend goes, yeah, yeah, off she goes. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I'd like to look at this. And I thought, oh, now I better be polite and keep up. So there I go, chugging ahead. And I missed everything. And I'm going, I, I want to see this stuff. This is good stuff. This is why I'm here. Oh, well, she wants to go and see what's going around the next corner. Okay, well, you can do that and I'll sniff here. <sighs> so, <laughs> exactly so that was it the first time i ever thought no hang on a minute we're doing this together the point is that i mean if you go around that garden with somebody who has the same interest in gardening or plants that you do you stop you look you smell you admire it you think I'd never have thought of growing something like that just there. And then you go, yeah, 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 let's move on. And there might be times when you stop and let the other person engage in something you're not interested in. But because you're connected, you stop and give them time to enjoy what they want to enjoy. So, so often the walk is about the person. The person wants to do this, that and the other. And it seems to be of zero benefit for the dog. So the dog is just hauled along because the person thinks this is a form of exercise. I don't think walking is ever a form of physical exercise for the dog. I think you've probably got to look at a completely different set of um, criteria for physical anaerobic exercise for the dog. Um, so every time the dog wants to stop, you know, the person stands there and gives them a sigh. Really? Again? But it's important to the dog. Yeah. And the sniff, I've hardly ever seen a sniff last more than 10 or 15 seconds. Yep. But if you allow the dog to sniff and track, then I think you can get into trouble. You can just spend the time tracking behind the dog. So I think there's also the courtesy of allowing the dog the time, but then the dog, when they've had that sniff and if they've had a pee as well, they should reconnect back to you. If they don't reconnect back to you, I would not proceed forwards. So the practice would be sniff, pee, whatever, have a think, ponder, look at your person person goes was that good he says yes that was really good okay let's move on together so um without that reconnecting the dog doesn't become aware that we're part of the actual walk i think also in this there's um a sort of um i don't know pressure to virtually take the puppies out for socialization which starts to become like a run free on the end of the lead type of experience yeah, so they are charging around every which way and everywhere because they're being socialized, but actually not learning the discipline of if you hit the end of the lead, then you need to check what's going on because the person's not with you. And instead of the person saying, look, you're going too fast, I can't keep up with you, or no, we're not just doing this wild running, um, the puppy will learn to be an, an eight-month-old dog that just hits the end of the lead and keeps hitting it without being aware of the, the fact that there's a weight on the end of the lead they just become a nuisance <laughs> so it all comes down to a mixture of things for connected walking to me it's not like well you can't go on until you look at me but it's about looking at me when you've had a pee to say thank you and about me saying is that good for you did you want to stop here and have a sniff uh, it's this two-way street so if we look at the walk through the dog's needs they need to sniff and if a dog was not attached to us i doubt if they would walk anywhere in a straight line 
yes they would browse go off track check this bit of a trot here bit of an amble there bit of a sniff here bit of a tracking there a roll in something here you know you know, <laughs> you know even if your dog's running free they don't maintain the same physical gait through the whole walk yes they're continually changing their gait and momentum so the more variety of gait that we can share the more the walk becomes a shared experience so you know first of all we go out i'm going to put you on a lead what's the purpose of this activity for the next five minutes for now if i'm just moving you to the car then i would have very clear parameters you walk to my side you walk close on a short lead i would probably use a lot of food for that to teach the puppy how to walk close and we go straight to the car in the car there's not a browse on the way. This is not time for sniffing. And I need to be able to teach that because there's times when I want to cross the road and you can't sniff the roadkill. We need to just know I can go straight across the road and not worry about what you're doing because I need to watch for traffic. Or there may be we're going for a browse, but I see something coming towards us that's potentially disrupting. And I'm going to need you just to walk quite close to me whilst we go past it. It could be some rubbish on the ground. I don't want you to sniff or glass or a canal boat going past. You know, there's there's a lot of things that I might need the dog to just close in and be at my side. So that comes out of teaching the dog that if I'm standing still, if the dog can't match me for standing still at my side, then how on earth can they match me when I'm actually moving? How can they recognize my behavior? And this is often not training so much as letting this natural connection emerge, because I think dogs connect very, very well. You know, I haven't had a single dog in over 40 years, but if I take two dogs out for a walk together, they pretty much are always aware of each other. And even if they're off lead, they're aware of what the other dog's doing. So dogs can naturally alter their pace. They can anticipate speed of movement. So if a dog was chasing a rabbit and it's coming in at an angle to where the rabbit's going, they can calculate extremely quickly where they need to be to take out the rabbit. So that's the same as if we are going for a walk off lead and the dog's going to join us, they will run towards where they see we are walking to and they will calculate the amount of gap we have to cover, you know, this perceptive skill. They don't run to where we were when we called them. They run to where we are walking towards by the time they arrive with us. So they've got great perceptive skills about speed and motion and how to be aware of who they're with. I think our pavements or sidewalks are often a bit restrictive you know the, the width of them certainly in our country lanes are quite narrow which often forces the dog to either be right in front or right close there's no range that the dog can afford to have without going into the road that can often be a bit of an issue um, but learning how to adjust your momentum to stay in connection with the group is part of the process so teaching the dogs that being still at our side or be able to stand at our side is step number one. That's, I'd call that the base behavior. You could reinforce that. Certainly for a dog that's got no experience of adjusting speed to people, you know, some of the dogs coming in that have never really been lead walked would need to learn that. And that can be reinforced with food. But we don't want to teach the dog that they've got to watch us all the time. This is um, a peripheral vision awareness. Yeah, so it, they, they need to be able to look at where they're going and feel free to sniff and, you know, check things out and pee and all the rest of it. We're not trying to make the dog do heel work. So sometimes the food can be too overwhelming and actually not teach the dog this perceptive awareness of how to be connected to us as we're moving around. Yeah, I mean, and I always teach it with my arms down. I don't like to see these clutched hands across the front of the body. If you've got large breeds of dogs, this puts you in a very vulnerable position and it doesn't look natural. So I like to walk in such a way that I look like I'm naturally walking with or without a lead. It's exactly the same posture. So my arms swing. I keep my elbows straight. Um, I also learn how to feed the lead to and fro. So the dogs on a six foot or a two meter lead, the dog can be at, at any range around me if it's safe to do so. So if we're out in um, an area where it's safe for the dog to be on that full range, they can be anywhere around me. Yes, it's not an issue. But if they come in close, then I'd have to take up the slack with the other hand. Um, and if we've got people with the super big dogs, um, you know, even from young puppies, before we put them on a lead with the dog, I will teach them the physics of how to brace if the dog goes for a bounce forwards 
so you don't get pulled over. So a lot of people will often walk tense by holding this lead to their center, but in actual fact, not learn how to brace if the dog pulls out suddenly. And a lot of people, this is this is the fear of going for a walk with a dog that could pull you over. And I remember years and years ago, you were never allowed to walk with the lead wrapped around your hand because if the dog went under a bus, it'd take you with it. Well, my first response was to wrap it tighter <laughs> because I'm not letting my dog under a bus. But it seemed to be this sort of silly presumption that you, you can't do this without actually looking at the physics of what we're what we're doing. So, yes, you need to think about your own body language, which needs to be relaxed. And we're here for a stroll. We're here just to amble around, which means you need loose arms, because the minute you bring those arms up, tense, bent elbow and your fists are clutched around your lead, your shoulders will go up and the dog will read. Warning. Keep an eye out. Scan. Yes, because it looks like you're ready for uh, trouble one way or another. So being able to be relaxed. Being able to come to a stop without stopping so suddenly the dog never knew you were going to stop. You wouldn't do that to another person. Another weird thing we do, if we turn around with a dog, 90% of people will turn away from the dog because that's how you do it. No, you don't. If you were walking on with a person, you wouldn't. If you were going back the way you've just come, you'd turn towards the person. You wouldn't turn away from the person. So it's about those little things that keep the connection. If you're going to change direction... You know, give the other person plenty of time that we might be talking, but, oh, I'd like to go and have a look and see what's in that shop. Ooh, yeah, and then the person would follow your interest. If they're not connected, by the time you'd left that partnership to go and have a look in the shop, they've walked on another 10 feet. And that's often the, the sort of, um, are we connected or not? Well, if I bring myself to a stop, not just free stop, the dog should bring themselves to a stop. If I look to my right and I start focusing to my right the dog would normally notice my focus if they don't notice my focus then they're not actually connecting in the sense they're not aware of my body language but just as equally it works two ways if my dog suddenly focuses on something to their side i should follow that focus and see if it's safe or not safe to actually go through with it well that's that was michelle's pulio's early training for the guide dog puppies um, and she originated where they teach these very young six, seven week old puppies that if the collar rotates, so if the collar's hanging down vertically, um, it's, it's like, um, we call it parking, Michelle calls it tethering. But at that point, my foot would be on the lead. And if the puppy starts to move, they would feel that the collar is pinned down vertically now this is nothing like the old mm -hmm. jam your foot on the lead and pull hard to make the dog lay down it's as far away as you can get as you can get from that so the lead is long enough for the puppy to be free to do what they want to do but not long enough that they can jump up yeah so if they try to do a little bit of bouncing they'll feel pressure on the collar but the weight of the clip would be on the front of the collar which would tell the dog you're in park oh, okay Alex would call it, uh, the adults are talking. Yeah, you remember when you were kids. No, stand still, the adults are talking at the moment. So that gives the puppy a license to sit there, watch the birds, look at those puppies across the room, you know, and do what they want to do. They can have a break, yes? And a lot of lead walking is quite intense focus. You know, after 10 minutes, it's a tiring process to constantly keeping focus on whoever you're with. So letting the puppy have a break. Certainly if somebody wants to come and talk to you, we would practice what I call emergency parking. So you put the dog into park quite quickly. Then if that lead starts to be lifted up because the person's take their foot off, they're gathering the lead, preparing to walk, there would mm -hmm. be a change in the actual weight of that clip and the collar. So as the, as the clip is lifted slightly to the side, that puppy will notice it and connect to you and realize that you are preparing to set off. Um, and so they can they can look at you, see which way you're going, see which way you're facing, work out that you normally walk forwards and they'll join you to walk forwards. And if that mm -hmm. collar is lifted to one side in preparation of turning, they should be able to respond to that. So to me, the collar cues, I can certainly imagine it with guide dogs, allow the dog to be focused on the environment ahead, yeah, but exactly. able to feel what the person is doing through the collar let them go into the bounds but not actually jerk back at the same time but that's a lot of people's reaction is to pull back when the dog pulls forward which causes right. this horrendous um you know 
flip flip once they hit the end of the lead. Yeah, anticipate yeah. that. People. Yeah. So you know, if you're going out for a walk, if you're going out for a walk with a small child, say you know you've decided to have twins and you've got to take them out for a walk and they're not tied to you your eyes would be swiveling all the time to make sure what's ahead what can they touch how would they be getting into trouble and i can't say it would be an enjoyable walk (laughs) oh don't eat that no no don't touch that don't go down there you know you spend most of the time telling them what not to do we see it in supermarkets regularly (laughs) (laughs) i'm just looking through your book an oldie but a good yeah one. every dog every day yeah but that's not in print uh, at the moment so don't over push it <laughs> no i don't yeah but, most but, of it's on the website at one sort or another yeah yeah it is it is but you know what i do love about the book is and and the information on the website is how much you asked handlers to have before stepping out the house i mean you know assessing the environment mm. can mm. you can you respond to changes in the environment can you anticipate um one of the things that kind of cracks me up is I have my students go out in the parking lot and say, okay, you're a dog. What do you want to do? And I'm amazed how many people do not notice there's a fire hydrant in the parking lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, yeah. yeah. Which to a dog is like a beacon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Or, you know, light poles or edges of hedges, things yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, where would you head? Um, well, we don't see the walk know. through the dog's eyes at all. You know, walking across a road is probably um, one of the most interesting places because all the roadkill. <laughs> and the dog said, and we're saying to the dog, no, no, walk on. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> you know, and sometimes the walks we go on. So here it's because it's quite arable land. It's it's really not much in the way of wildlife in the fields. You with me? You've got to look around the edge of the field to find most of the wildlife. So if I want to go straight across the middle of a, a beautifully mown lawned playing field, the dog's going to go, really? There's nothing out there. It's a desert. There's nothing to sniff. Mm. Yes, because wildlife wouldn't put itself out there for any reason at all. You know, if it's if it's prey, it's far too vulnerable. And the predators wouldn't be there because there's no prey. So, yeah, no, thank you. So learning to see what the dog sees to me is is part of the pleasure of going for a walk, seeing what they find is really cool to have a sniff on, what's really hot. And often we send our clients home with, I want you to be able to come back and describe three different types of sniffs that the dog does. So they can stop on a patch of grass and have a good sniff. And then you know the dog's going to want to pee. And how do you know that? Well, there's a certain way they do that sniffing that tells you they're sniffing urine. Or they could be what I call sniffing hot, where they're just zigzagging around, quite frenzied. And that is very likely to be the track of a wild animal that they're sort of picking up that's wandered around. Especially if it's a bird, it'll tend to wander around while they go in a straight line. Or if it is a rabbit or a fox going through, they'll pick up that track and go in a straight line. And the dogs know whether they're going with the track or down the track, i.e. up the track or down the track, going the way the animal's gone or going back to where the animal's come from. Or have they put their nose in the air and they're just picking up bits and pieces on the wind? You know, and all these things are ways the dog sees the environment. And then we're saying to them, forget that. (laughs) You've got to walk along by my side. And if you're very lucky, I'll slap my leg harder to make you pay attention. (laughs) So you can see the dog's thinking, I tell you what, if I just wander a bit over here, let's, let's see if she'll slap her leg again. Oh, yeah, there she goes. Yeah. Oh, look, and then oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I th- I think I, I always like to rem- imagine that my dogs are are saying, you know, yeah, go, yeah, go ahead and have a good sniff, you know, because this next time I'm I I know that you want to go sniff, but guess what? We have to keep going just a little bit. And I like to think in the back of my mind that my dogs are going, oh well, she doesn't always tell me I can't sniff, so I'll, I'll let her do I, this. I think we need to say there are times for sniffing and there's times for not. You know, and a dog can appreciate that, yeah. that times of danger is not the time for sniffing. But we need a clear set yeah. of contingencies. So personally, I shorten the lead right down. I bring the dog close to side. And there will be some play on the collar. So you're not hauling the dog along on a tight collar. Oh, um, God, no. uh-uh. But you're asking the dog to stay close to your side. You walk with a really seriously good pace. You focus on where you're going. You go there. Then you release all the tension. And the dog goes, all right. Yeah, I go, all right. Go on, off you go. and have yeah. your So you can't have this mix and match without a clear definition that right at this moment you can browse. 
but goodness me, there's a car coming. So right now you need to go tight to my side. Car's gone. Now we can go back to browsing or crossing a road or I'm just walking you from car to house. You know, it's not this continual expectation that the dog never pulls. You know, the question has to be, do you never pull? And I don't know any person that can't say they don't pull. But if you do want to change direction, come to a stop, allow the dog to stop, look at you and show them which way you want to go. And we just do that by just yeah. face, facing a different way. So if you want to yeah, go off 90 degrees, the dog can work out which the front of you is. And as long as you don't do walking like a crab, they'll be able to work out that you just wait for them to check in and have a look. Sure. Yeah, cool. We're going this way now. Oh, okay, that's fine. Yes, it's when we do this random yeah, come this way, go that way, don't do this, don't do that. You know, so we oh, manage the dog through the lead and it's 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 not good for the dogs at all. So they end up just ignoring us because there's just too much information to actually be able to oblige. Too much information. Yeah. And 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 leave the Fitbit at home. You know. Oh all oh, oh, right. So it tells you how many steps you're taking. Yeah. yeah but it doesn't yeah. presumably um, the same number of steps will happen whether you take it half an hour or ten minutes. Exactly. Yeah. So you know, no forced pacing. No, no, no. That's no. what I try to tell my kids. Because if the dog, do force yeah, pacing. if the dog is stuck between their trot and their walk, they have the most unnatural movement, which is fine if you're just crossing the road for a short period of time. But if you do this lengthy action, it's the same as you walking with your hand on the same side as your leg. So if you put your hands just above your knees on the side of your trousers and walked continually like that, you would end up with serious back issues. And um, this is what, and then we wonder why the dogs are a little reactive because by this point, oh my god, my back aches. Yeah, yeah. don't touch yeah. me. Don't come near me. I can't move my body. You know, and there's there's many a professional in this business that has to um, work with dogs with severe back problems from this. So just because a piece of equipment makes the leap walk comfortable for you, does not necessarily come as benefit to the dog. And, and and equipment uh, sellers do like to make their money, oh, though. Oh, gosh, yes. There'll be another gimmick. You know, and I've said this before, the pet market is so vulnerable to the next best piece of junk that's going to make your life so much easier. Yeah, whereas most of it mm -hmm. is just a bit of logic and empathy as to why is this such an issue for the dog? Why do I always see the dog back of the dog's head? So what's reinforcing this behavior? If the dog's going forwards and you follow it, you are reinforcing this behavior end of if it's happening mm -hmm. again and again and again something is reinforcing this behavior so if i wanted to teach my dog to pull uh, as soon as they surge forward i would be behind them saying yes go on then i'm with you don't worry about me keep going and i would hold a tight lead so they knew where i was and i could hold them tight and they never need to look back at me because i'm holding it tight you know, so that whole tight lead is it's got so much going for it that maintains that behavior because now the dog can be out the front doing its good old pavement swim you know scanning the environment dragging this dead weight behind and they know you're there because you're hanging on for dear life <laughs> yeah so why would they look at you you know and even if you just right. come to a stop and go i can't breathe i have to stop the dog's gonna go look back and go so what's wrong with you then <laughs> more fitness woman you know uh, they're going to look back at some point you know <laughs> Why she stopped? You know, but you know, I do feel I do so feel so sorry for some of the people that I see like this because they truly are struggling. They don't know how to do this. Mm -hmm. They just are struggling, yeah, and yeah. and I just I just sort of want to be able to coach them better. And if the dog is going about. from the house to the park to have fun, the reinforcement for this dog is getting to the park. The park. So they really don't care that they're pulling, and they don't care that it's unpleasant. The reinforcement value of being able to get to the park and run and socialize and go off lead far exceeds the discomfort of getting to the park. You know, so we set up these patterns that the dogs work it out fairly quickly. Yep. Mm. Mm. So we are we so. are our own worst enemy with walking on leads. We are really are. Too much focus on the lead, not enough focus on teaching the dogs how to walk with us as opposed to using the lead to make them walk with us. So if we went back yeah. 100 years where there wasn't dog leads, I don't know, it's very rare. We'll go back 200 years, no dog leads. So how are you going to make, how are you going to set it up that your dog will want to stay with you, not have to stay with you? Apart from the fact mm. the environment wasn't so dangerous, but, you know, most dogs learn how to stay with their people. 
Yeah, they you know, do. How do they manage that? And I, as, as, speak, as speaking as somebody who probably walks her dogs off lead more than on yeah. lead. Yeah. Uh, with with an inappropriate environment. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and it really it's it's absolutely delightful to me at times to be walking. I have I have the opportunity to walk on a beach fairly regularly. It's a fairly self contained mm-hmm. beach. It's mm-hmm. dunes on one side, the ocean on the other. Just a perfect environment. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, my dogs can be you know twenty five, thirty five yards away from me, walking on a parallel path. Yes. They know yes. exactly where I am. And if we've taught them the skill of how to walk with us when they're within two or three meters, then they'll be able to do that when they're within twenty or thirty meters. But if we've only ever managed oh, yes. them on a lead that stop them running off yes. when that lead's not there they haven't got any skills to be able to monitor where we are yes. adjust their stride to to us you know lead or no lead so there's very little future for being off lead if we haven't taught them this connected walking on lead, on lead. i think uh-huh. i mean also i've and had then... some issues with zip on lead um i you know certainly with collies if they're on lead amongst traffic the displacement behavior can very often be towards the lead because they get so frustrated yes. by not being able to control the movement of the cars or children or whatever, they will actually take it out on the lead or the person that's on the other end of the lead. So the whole package becomes extremely traumatic. So probably for the first six months, I hardly ever had her on a lead. Now, when she's on a lead, she's often on a flexi because that's easier for her to manage. <gasps> a flexi. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, it's just a question of learning how to manage it properly. Um, <clears throat> and this is a wide open field. This is not walking down the street. So, but I notice if she is going to somewhere she's never been before, i.e. in a new place, she doesn't pull whatsoever. But if she's heading to somewhere where she has been before and she wants to get there, she'll pull like a train. And I'm going, Mm -hmm. you know, you think, well, she knows how to not pull. So why are we getting pulling now? Ah, because she wants to get there first. Mm. She wants to get there first. Mm. Yes. So even if I stand outside the front door and wonder which gate I'm going to go out to go for a walk. I've got three choices. As soon as I take a step towards the gate, I'm going to go out. She's at that gate, you know, 25 yards ahead of me. And then I change my mind and I go to the other gate. (laughs) She's at the other gate. So of course she was on a lead. She would be pulling. Yes. Um, So it's often not, Oh, my dog's pulling. It's under these conditions. Why is the dog pulling? Why does the dog want to be, ahead of you under these conditions do they want to get away from something or do they want to get to something if they know where you're going so she's just being a smart little dog and anticipating where i'm going so we were training the other day and the journey is between the car and the training barn all around the field now she'll pull both ways because she wants to go in to do training she'll pull when she comes out because she loves her car and she'll pull when she goes across the field. But then when we're walking across the field of no particular purpose, going nowhere, exciting, she's just happily mooching around. So that's another confusion huh. that people say, well, she doesn't pull here, but she does pull there. Then you've really got to do some analysis as to why those conditions stimulate the dog to do that behavior under those conditions. You know, And so... Uh... So having that, I mean, I mean, what would you do? Do do you feel the need to? Oh Jesus! You just did the girl this morning. <laughs> so um, so popular. Focus on this now. Uh, I th- yeah, I think we have. To, she certainly will have to learn a yes, but you can't race there. In other words, she'll have to learn mm-hmm. to. Ooh, do the what I call the racehorse, the jiggy jig sideways. I want to go forwards. I know, I know, but not quite as fast as I can uh, because it's not safe to let her go ahead of me, certainly. Um, but there's times when, yeah, I don't mind. She can go ahead to the end of the lead. It's not, she's not that big. You know, she wants to go and train in the barn. Yeah, okay, I don't mind. <laughs> so, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes it doesn't matter that they pull a bit. Yes, they're only going to a <gasps> short destination and when they get there, they're done. But could I say her actually not at this moment in time you need to walk by my side absolutely you know and that's where you might need to use the lure where you do the what i call the walk and nibble you know Mm -hmm. where you actually ask them just to nibble as they walk along just to prevent something else from happening but that's just management that's not teaching them to walk on a lead Mm -hmm. yeah okay and i think that that's the difference that people miss I, I I get accused of letting my dogs run roughshod over me, and I'm going. Well, where do you get that impression? Yeah, yeah. Oh, like dogs I, must never jump up. Well, again, no, this came yeah. up over the weekend. If I take Merrick into a new place, there's a lot of jumping up for about three or four minutes, 
until she knows what's mm. happening. As soon as I open the treat pot and we say we're training, that's fine. And it's a certain stress. Yes. So if she's a little bit stressed about or excited, I don't know which, I will get jumped on. So under those conditions, if I went no jumping, no jumping, no jumping, I am just simply not responding to her needs at that time. Yes. So, you know, to me, that's a bit of um, blindness into what is, is actually happening. And we, we tend to look, you know, not all reasons for pulling are the same. Not all reasons for jumping up are the same. This is where we have to become seriously good analysts and work out what is the dog trying to say by doing this? And what have I said by doing this? You know, if a dog is continually jumping up and hitting you with this, you know, rather hard jump up, have you stopped responding to the dog? You know, is there something there that the mm. dog's trying to say? How else would they say it? Like Zip, if she says, I need to get away from this, I don't like the sound of this tractor whatsoever, and she pulls... Well, then she needs to pull. She needs to get away from this tractor. You know, yes, yes. loosely be damned. Yeah. Sometimes just get out yeah. of dodge, as yeah. I say. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But, you know, we need, well, we, we can... need good lead handling. We need to be aware of what we're doing. We need to be aware of what the dog's trying to say. And there are some environments when you're walking the dog through that are just simply far too overwhelming for the dog to be able to manage anything else. But let me hold your hand. You know, let me just help you do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so different walks, different places, different purposes, different requirements, different reinforcers, exactly. different cues. Mm -hmm. It's not easy, no. <laughs> but it's certainly no. not. And it is probably sorry. It's certainly not going round and round a room saying heal. It's got nothing to do with it whatsoever. Absolutely nothing to do with it, and it has everything to do with how you want to go through life with your dog. Yes. Absolutely, yes. Yes. it's like often the core of our relationship. Particularly if yes. you want to be out and about and you want to do long distance walking or hiking, you know, your dog being on a lead is a is a critical part of this. And and trying to make it argument free or conflict free surely has to be a priority. You know, I, I like you, I'm rarely on lead with my dogs, but if I needed to walk all six on a lead, I could do it. I think if do I have yes. six leads? I think I might. <laughs> um but yes, I could do it if I needed to, but it's it's not a high priority for me because I'm not going to spend that much time with them on lead. But if it's an absolute yeah. requirement for you to be able to spend your, your leisure time together tethered, then you need to be able to work out some seriously good tethering protocols. Right, right. I always joke around that if people were to see me walking my three dogs on lead around town, they'd think I was the worst trainer in the world. And I know exactly <laughs> what I'm doing. I truly, yes, truly, truly yes. do. Mine just knit but a lot. I can... <laughs> So that they're, they're loose ish around, but it's not tidy, you know, it's not tidy. But yes, it's sort of one in and out, one under, one round the back, one this way, one that way. And a wonderfully braided yes, that's right. three yes. leads at the end that's of it right. all. Yeah. That's who cares. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. But I'm not walking in on roads very often. I'm not walking in unsafe areas and I'm certainly not park walking. But you know, if we could yeah. we would. Yeah. All right. Much to yes. choose. In the episode notes, you'll find links to classes and courses taught by Kay Lawrence through Learning About Dogs. And for those who live in the San Francisco Bay Area, a chance to learn in person with me at the Humane Society of Sonoma County. This is the end of the first season of Learning About Dogs, the podcast. We did 21 episodes, meaty things that need a few listens to reach those aha moments. We hope you enjoyed listening as much as we have enjoyed figuring out this whole podcasting gig. Two dog ladies talking about dogs. Kay and I are taking a bit of a break to tend to our dogs and our gardens. But we want to hear from you. If you have a topic you would like us to talk about on the podcast, please let us know. You do that by going to our Facebook group whilst I was listening to the podcast. Answer a few questions and you can join us. And as usual, go to Apple iTunes, post a starred review, and leave us a review. Thanks for listening to this season, and join us in the fall when new episodes will start appearing again.